welcome. I'm Jane Eliasoff. I'm the director of the Montclair History Center. Um, I'm just going to start out with a brief commercial. If you're looking for a good present for a history lover, check out our website. Uh, we have some books, old and new. We've got uh, personalized maps. You can get it with your uh, address on it. Uh, we have the 1906, the 1926, the 1934 atlases or um, maps so you can take a look and see which one you like better. You can even give somebody a membership to the Montclair History Center if you're interested. Um, if you'd like to support our programming efforts, there are several ways that you can do that. Um, you can- I just um, put them in the chat, Jane. You put them in the chat? Thanks, yep. Helen. You can do it by check, Venmo, um, do it on our website. And we also, as of yesterday, now take Zelle. Um, and Helen posted that for you. So you can just choose whichever way um, if you're so inclined, of course. I'm and also gonna put the that. link to the, I'll also put the link to the personalized maps. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, George, George Musser, who's our presenter tonight. Um, he is a science writer um, and can tell you everything you've ever wanted to know about string theory, theoretically in a way that we can all understand. And um, he also is a former trustee of the Glen Ridge Historical Society. And I think you're really going to enjoy this because we saw it this afternoon. And I know there are several people who have come back to watch it again because they liked it so much. So um, I turn it with that over to George and thank you for joining us again tonight. Jane, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming. I can't wait to hear your ideas, your input, your feedback. And believe me, this whole History at Home series has kept me going these past few months. I mean, it's so isolating. Uh, I love my house. I love my old house, but it's great to, to meet people. Um, and actually, a lot of people probably you wouldn't make it if it weren't for these online sessions. So it's just so, so great. And I'm happy that you're here. Thanks for okay. that. Well, let's get this on the road here. So, uh, my motivation, I have a lot of motivations for this project, which I'll touch on uh, as I go on, but I'll, one of the big ones is the road system that we have here. To call it a system when you have these spaghetti junctions sometimes seems a bit of a stretch, but it's, okay, there we go. Um, we have some of the strangest road intersections ever, don't we? I mean, we've got this one by the hospital and the one at Bloomfield and Highland that I'm showing here. And how do you make sense of these junctions of, of many roads. And what I invite you to do is to not curse them and not wish you weren't there, but to think about them. And, and, you, and I invite you to read the landscape. I think we can actually, through different methods that I'll talk about today, you can actually peel it apart almost like an archeological dig. And I think that that's important. I mean, a lot of the traces we have of, mm -hmm. of the deep old history, that's my main interest, and as in the history going back to the first settlement, European settlement of our area and even to the native times, a lot of the history has been lost and it's imprinted on our landscape and sometimes that's the only way we can recover it. So uh, I think it was six or seven years ago, I was on a sabbatical in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where you're surrounded by this history. People take pride in history. If you get on one of these kind of weird Boston roads where you get in the right lane to turn left or have to go in a big loop or whatever, you, um, you say, oh, it's just an old cow path. And I think we've lost a lot of that kind of continuity, historical continuity uh, in New Jersey. So all over the place, there were monuments to the Minutemen marching off to fight the Redcoats and retreating back in, into Boston and then the eventual evacuation. We in New Jersey have just as interesting or more maybe interesting history and you barely even see it. There are a few markers. Here's one that's old by the, uh, the old church, uh, just off uh, kind of, this is actually Route 21 here in the background here, um, just where the Route 7 bridge crosses over the Passaic. This teeny, teeny little only marker that I know of in the Essex County of the retreat route of Washington and the Rembrandt and an army took as they were on their way to, to restart the Revolutionary War. So it's an exciting history that we have here and we should take pride in it. And I, I think we should reclaim it. And we're gonna start with thinking about roads and geography in general. And this is where 
I come in. So about three years ago, I started a just personal project to map Essex County as it was. My goal was just at the beginning. So 1666, when the Dutch and the English and the Africans got off the ships here, what did this area look like? That is, that's the goal here. That pro matching pro mapping project's never been done. There's bits and pieces of maps for, actually there's quite a good one for South Orange, that area, downtown Newark as well established. Lawrence Township, so places elsewhere in the state have been mapped in this way, but never Northern Essex County. So I think that's important to, 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 to fill in that gap. This is actually the oldest map, the oldest, I should say, detailed map. We have, we have older maps, uh, but the oldest detailed map we have of our area, uh, this shows, of course, Bloomfield, downtown Bloomfield mostly. It's a beautiful map as a work of cartography. Um, but remember, 1856, when this map was made, already it's half, really only half the history of Essex County since then. So almost 200 years of history occurred before the creation of this map. So when this map was created in 1856, and there's a comparable one that shows Montclair as well in 1865, the, the street grid is kind of what it is today. The, the street names are in place, the basic patterns of land usage, the commercial districts are in place. So all the creation of those things, the streets, the commercial districts, et cetera, predate this map. They're in this kind of missing link period of our history that I'm hoping to recover. So let's start with when I set out to do this, I had to begin just by taking what we do know, which is again, this 1865 map, and I made it my base map. This is my starting point. So the, this kind of area up here is that map. It's tilted, it's a bit, I've actually corrected it a bit for the topography, so it's true to the geography uh, of our area. And I've, I actually, we'll talk a bit about that later. There's some interesting corrections you have to do for the topography. And then down here in, in a kind of Verona, Caldwell and into the oranges, I didn't have that equivalent map and I wasn't so interested in those areas. I, I love West Orange, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't my main interest here. So I just put in a less detailed, but actually slightly older map to cover those areas. This is my map, this will be the basis of discussion for the rest of my remarks tonight showing roads, waterways, very important, and property lines. And so it's make it a little easier to see, I'll take away the base map, and this is what we're gonna work with. Now, I have no expectation that you're gonna be able to read this map on your screen. I can barely read it on mine, and certainly over Zoom, it's impossible to see, but I'm gonna kind of pick out some areas of interest as we go along and, and walk you through this. And our goal here is really to, to plumb this very deep history that shaped the area, our area as we know it and the people that were involved in that. Let's take a little just orientation on this map and I'm, we're going to kind of put in a little animation that's going to zoom around. We'll start with downtown Montclair. And as we go through, by the way, look at some of the road names that there are. So downtown Montclair, then downtown Bloomfield. Notice the road to Newtown the old road to Horseneck, these old evocative names. Then we'll kind of scoot up and Brookdale, the Brookdale area, that's as far north as I've gone so far. I've actually got data for Upper Montclair and the north part of Bloomfield, but I haven't put that in yet. And then we'll go down to the south end, kind of around Rosedale, actually getting into to west and, and, and orange um, as well. I'm tra actually trying to link up with the maps that have been made of this, the, the oranges eventually. So You're when you get into this kind of historical second, archival got, deep dig. If you dig, guys have got yes, your um, I can do that. videos up, can you shut them down because we're getting some feedback on you. And um, I think that perhaps if everybody turns off their video, it might be a clearer, clearer uh, sound. Okay, so the sound is a problem, you say? You're, you're just fading in and out or, you know, ah. kind of underwater. So um, so if you could, if everybody could just stop their video, I think that we that might solve the problem. And it looks like Barbara's raising her hand as long as we've stopped for a moment. Barbara, talk, talk to us. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll resume this. Can, can people hear me? If, uh, Jane, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. We're good. Okay, if that happens again, we'll take a, a 30 second break. I'll go get my headphones on and often I find that cures any kind of feedback effect. Sounds good. I, I can hear you fine. Awesome, yay, thanks everyone. <laughs> so let's do this again. Okay. We're back to our map. And okay. we're gonna kind of zoom in. We're gonna zoom in on a couple interesting tidbits of information that you begin to see when you get into this research. Look at Walnut Street. Walnut Street used to be a guy's driveway. Sure. Then let's go just take another look at another tidbit down by Glenridge High School. That area used to be called Fox Field. Who knows why? Probably foxes. And if you go a bit south of that, this is actually kind of by Linden and Ridgewood. Uh, there was a place called Persimmon Field. So when you we start to dig into our history, this is a, as of basically 1800. This is the oldest county level information that I've been able to acquire. Our area kind of looked like rural areas of, of you know, the western part of New Jersey. If you go out to Hunterdon County, uh, kind of Warren County with large farms and, and towns dotted across the landscape, that's kind of what Essex County looked like before it became filled in and urbanized. So let's pull back, whoa, let's pull back to the view from, from 30,000 feet and just forget the details for a second. Let's just talk about the basic pattern of land use because in this period between this map is meant to represent the year 1800 and the first such map to do so really that gets this whole area between 1800 and 1856, which is the map we saw before, there's huge transformations in our landscape that really made the landscape what it is. So notice here, there's no Bloomfield Avenue. There's no Morris Canal, for example. There's no train lines yet. There's actually, if you were paying attention to the street names or if you could see them, there actually, there aren't any street names. All these roads are like the road to Horseneck, the road to Swinefield, the road to Patterson, the road to Franklin or to Newtown. A lot of these names don't even exist anymore, right? So, and actually here's the funny thing, when there was a, those main roads to Patterson or to whatever, when they had to put a road in between them, they called it the road to the road to. That's the best they could do. And the names that we, we associate today didn't come until the 19th century, or later in the 19th century. Notice also the creeks. I put them on because they're very important. We don't really think about them. In a lot of places they've been culverted or just lost or they're manholes in the ground. But the creeks, the waterways, are uh, major geographic markers in this period. Their, their property lines, their transportation, uh, their water for the farms. So they're extremely important in this, in this early period. Uh, most of the area is obviously still farmland, but it's being subdivided. And it's not being subdivided as you might have thought it would be. So it's not like downtown Montclair or what was known as Crane Town, not like downtown Montclair became subdivided first or downtown Bloomfield, it's actually these other areas. So this area down here, if you can see my pointer, is Elm and Orange, kind of where Fullerton also comes in. So that area down here was one of the first to be, to be divided into plots that are really too small to farm. It's not, uh, not sustainable anymore in terms of, of rural economy. Um, downtown Montclair is actually st still fairly large farms. There's this weird little string of plots here that is basically, uh, Chestnut. So uh, over here in Rosedale Cemetery, and there's a logic to this. The, the farms in this area have been broken up by the, the inheritance. They're, people are having too many kids, basically, and their, their farms are being partitioned among the sons and often also among the daughters. And they're just, they're very small by this point in history. Um, by the way, I should say that this map uh, though it took me almost three years to make even this this map, it's for me it's just a stepping stone. I want to go all the way back to uh, really the 17th century, and I see this map uh, of the beginning of the 19th century as a stepping stone to that ultimate aim. So along the way, I've done a lot of genealogy, and I know a lot of people here are experts in that much more than me. And if you have genealogical information about your families, 
um, especially prior to 1800, if you've gone that deep into your family history, I'd, I'd love to talk to you because understanding genealogy is essential understanding land and the other way around. So if you go to this website, eastjerseyhistory.org, it's just a website I set up, you can find this big family tree. It's got 3,000 some odd names on it. Um, and actually what's interesting is all of the people, basically all the people living in Bloomfield, Montclair, what we know as Glen Ridge at that time, were also just one big family. They're all intermarried. They're, it's just one ginormous family occupying Essex County. This is really before immigration. I mean, I'm a, I'm a quarter Irish. So this is before the Irish, this is before the Italians. It's just really, um, it's capturing this period where it's mostly the original settlers and their descendants that have occupied our area. So I want to give a quick kind of backstory. I want to back up a second here and talk about my own motivations in this project because that also leads you to understand why you might find this useful or might it might help in understanding our historical origins. So my wife and I moved to Glen Ridge in 2002 and did a lot of house, like a lot of people, a lot of house research. We went to the Glen Ridge Historical Society and looked at our house file. We did the whole thing with the Hall of Records um, and other places and prepared a huge report on that. Independently, I also am super interested, oh, by the way, this is our house. I actually put this up mainly because I want to show you the power of colorization. This is actually a basically turn of the century image of our house that I've run through a colorizing filter on myheritage.com. And it's actually amazing what it can do. Um, it picked up the green grass and the red fire hydrant and uh, the colors of the house didn't really come out, uh, but it's very evocative for what our area used to look like in those days. I, I should say that this beautiful widow's watch on our, that was on top of our house is no more. It was taken away at some point, but it happens. Um, this is the oldest deed our house didn't even exist yet. This is the oldest deed for about 70 years before our house was made. So I got interested after doing this initial research in what happened to the land before our house was built. I went back to the Hall of Records. I was probably on lunch break of jury duty and looked at, uh, there's a back room you can go into, it's kind of cool, and found this deed from uh, 1800. Um, so this is the land before our house was there. What was there? I was just so curious. What was the place like? Was it just forest? Was it farm or just abandoned? Who knows? Separately, I'm interested in other, like us all, in other historical parts of our, our heritage. So who knew, or how many people here knew there was a copper mine in Glenridge? Hmm. I discovered this maybe, I don't know, eight years ago that there had been one. It's kind of over where Central School uh, is now. Uh, it was rediscovered in the late, uh, excuse me, 1800s when there was a quarrying project and they quarried into it and they found, oh my God, there's all these tunnels here. What are they doing there? Um, dated to the sometime in the early 1700s, but completely lost to history. There's no contemporaneous account of this mine. Even today, there's tunnels under maybe under Bluefield Cemetery or certainly on Hillside Avenue. They're still there. There was a sinkhole that opened up in the 1920s uh, it, due to this mine, by the way, just like the, the ones they have in West Virginia, except a lot smaller. So we don't know anything about this mine. We don't really think that there was a major industrial enterprise and we know just zilch about it because we don't have these early records. And finally, I think I'm interested as many of us are in the native history of, of our area. So the Lenape people, actually, there's been archeological and ethnographic work. There's the testimony of the Lenape themselves, their descendants in Oklahoma. But we know very little about what they're doing here in our part of Essex County. And that's something I hope to recover by looking at these. And it's indeed one of the only ways we can hope to recover them by looking at these very old deeds. By the way, this uh, back next when the Bloomfield Historical Society Museum reopens, I invite you to go and look at their Arrowhead collection. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, it was taken from the area of what's now Brookdale Park, all these uh, artifacts. And it seems there was some kind of settlement in Brookdale Park. So with all this as motivation, I began to look at the early colonial land grants or patents. 
Um, it's a complicated system and I'm gonna blur over the terminology here, but basically the English colonial authorities bought land from the native people. They actually tried to keep it on the, on the up and up, bought land from the native people, at least in our area, it's not like the West, bought the land and resold it to the colonists, obviously at a huge markup, what do you expect? This is what one of those land grants look like. This little patch here in this beautiful and almost indecipherable script is one of these early land patents. Um, it actually took me a long time to better decipher this, this kind of thing. They're also extremely vague. They're like, go to the oak tree that's been marked by an ax, march north, and then bear off a little bit to the right. I mean, it's, it's, it's these, this data is, it's almost impossible to place a lot of these original patents. So I quickly discovered that I couldn't immediately answer my question of who owned my house or the land of my house because the data is just too vague. I had to broaden the scope of my project. And that's why I'm ending up mapping almost all of Northern Essex County now with ridiculous kind of mission creep of my project um, in order because I had to situate this in some kind of larger context. So I've been to, obviously the Montclair History Center has got a great archive, the Glenridge Historical Society, Bloomfield Historical Society. I've been to the libraries of all these towns, Newark Library, Public Library. Ridgewood has a quite a good historical archive section in their library. Um, actually, one of the best that I found is up in Ridgewood. Hall of Records, New Jersey Historical Society. Let me put a plug in for them. Go join them. In fact, I implore you after this call is over, go and join the New Jersey Historical Society. Not only do they need it, you need them. They're incredible. They've got a huge archive. They're preserving all this history that would just be lost if it weren't for them. So just kudos to them. And I, I just shout out to New Jersey Historical Society. New York Historical Society. I've been to the Alexander Library at Rutgers. I've been to the state archives. They just sick of me down in Trenton. They don't wanna see my face anymore. I've even went to Salt Lake to visit the Family History Library out there, which is also a peerless uh, collection. And during the pandemic, the Mormons have put a lot of their stuff online. You can go on and, and basically look at old microfilm or microfilm of old documents online. So I've, that's kept me going during the pandemic with the project. So I've got a jigsaw puzzle of thousands of pieces. I've got like 3,500 uh, plots in my, in my database. Here, you can get a sense of it here. There's a, actually software called Deed Mapper. If it weren't for that, I'd just be, I, where could I go with this? Uh, there's enough of crazy people like me uh, to keep a project like Deed Mapper going. They've actually got software, runs on Windows machines. I have a Mac, so I have to kind of work that or work around that. And you enter the deed information into here and it plots it on the ground for you. And as I said, I've got 3,500 or so in there that I'm trying to make sense of. All right. This is actually more of it. I'll get back into that in a second. So let's think about some of the quirks. And this is where we can really start to read the landscape in an interesting way with the arm with all this information. So the, the deeds have a lot of errors in them. This, they put north when they meant south and they put 30 when they meant 20. I mean, it's actually very hard to, to figure out. Um, but there's one type of error or discrepancy, that's not really an error. It's actually something very telling. And that is systematic discrepancies in surveys. So here I've given an example. Here is a map of 1850, from 1850 showing uh, Bloomfield, the oranges. And this is the line between Bloomfield, just going down Bloomfield, Montclair, Glenridge, and oranges, West Orange, Orange, and East Orange. This is the line, this dotted thing, as it is actually on the ground. I've actually oriented this map to match up the actual uh, town line. This kind of purple pinkish thing here is the survey. If you actually, as I did, if you take the survey from 1808 when they divided the two towns and you just plot it out, this is what you get. You get something that's pretty close, but systematically offset from the line on the ground. It's, in fact, it's offset by three degrees. If you rotate this three degrees, it'll just line up pretty dead on. So it turns out that three degrees matches the difference between magnetic north and true north as of the year 1808 when this was created. 
So this is an effect called magnetic declination that true north and magnetic north are a little bit off from one another. And it's due to the migration of the magnetic poles with respect to the poles of rotation of our planet. So that geophysical effect and the fact that they didn't take into account in this period is imprinted on our land today. So it actually turns out there's a whole history of this. Uh, this is a, one of the compasses, beautiful. Uh, David Rittenhouse's compass that's held by the American Philosophical Association, uh, Society down in Philadelphia. Uh, David Rittenhouse was, a, you know, from Rittenhouse Square, but was also a surveyor. He worked closely with James Alexander, who was the surveyor general of the Jerseys. And they knew about this effect, this declination effect. They also knew that it varied in time magnetic variation, but they didn't have any good way to, to incorporate it into their surveying. It wasn't until actually 1796 that they had a good instrument to do this. And I'm seeing that that instrument's not really being used even well into the 1800s, that they're not taking this effect into account. You don't get the USGS topograph, topographic maps until the late 1800s, like 1870, 1880. So there's a period of many decades that this effect is not taken into account. And you see it in the lands. So a lot of the weirdness of our street system, as I'll show in just a second, a lot of the weirdness of the skewed spaghetti lines we have here is this magnetics effect. Okay, so let's take a classic example of a weird spaghetti intersection in our area. This is Bloomfield and Highland, which also has Glen Ridge, it has Belleville, it has Freeman Parkway, it has the train line. It's a mess, right? So using this kind of archeological mentality, let's peel back the layers and see if we can make sense of this, and we can, of this intersection. So the first thing you can do is look at the records for when the roads were laid out. Um, so Bloomfield Avenue was originally called the Newark and Pompton Turnpike. God, we have a lot of turnpikes in New Jersey, don't we? Um, it had toll booths even. So uh, it was laid out probably actually in 1807, although the company was incorporated in 1806. Um, Highland was put in in 1869. Um, Belleville or this section of Belleville in 1874. And by the way, these records for the roads, there's a special book called a Road Returns at the county clerk at the Hall of Records. So every now and then I go in there to read their Road Returns book and I have to explain to them what it is. They don't even know they have them. They're like, who are you? Why do you want to look at our books? And I'm like, well, they're, they're just right there. Let me go look at them. I'm, hist I'm a historian. They're like, they don't understand. Why and have to explain again? They had to bring in the actual the county clerk to let me in and look at these these old records. So it's kind of there's a, anyway there's a whole story with that. So the oldest by default, if nothing else, the oldest road here is Glenridge Avenue and actually leading into this bottom section of, of Bloomfield. That's the original road alignment here. I should point out that there's a, it cut, kind of cut off this corner of Highland and, and Bloomfield and actually. There's a se separate record in 1895 called they vacated that section of, of Glenridge Avenue actually allowed this house to be built here. Um, so this is actually telling us something about our area and we can actually probe a little bit deeper into what it means. So Glenridge Avenue, uh, this uh, actually this entire thing that I've colored in red, there's never any road return for it. There's no record of ever having been laid out in the, in, the de in the deeds or in these road records or anything else really. In fact, quite to the contrary, the deeds make reference to it. It always has been here. It's, it's kind of the, the rock in the landscape. So I think probably it's pre-Columbian. It probably is an, originally a native a trail uh, that the settlers uh, coming in, this is your English settlers now coming up from Newark into our area. The Dutch kind of came down from the north. I'll get back to them in a moment. Uh, came in and modified this old trail and for their own use. And there's actually an interesting thing. We can bring the magnetic information now. So if you go to the geophysical uh, reconstruction of migrations of the magnetic poles of our planet, it's it's a, there's a system in the year 1666. So when uh, Newark was settled, you find that the magnetic 
direction of magnetic north was about eight, just under eight degrees west of true north. And lo and behold, Glenridge Avenue, the section of Glenridge Avenue here, just north of that intersection, is about seven degrees west of north. So I speculate, I can't, I don't know, God wasn't there. I speculate that the settlers came in and laid out a perfectly north road using their limited compasses of their time, thought they were going true north, they were actually going magnetic north. And over this the century since then, the, the poles have varied and we, but we're left with this fossil imprint in our landscape of the original orientation of the Earth's poles, of magnetic poles. Now there's a lot more we can say about, uh, about this that is also quite telling. So here is to my knowledge, the second oldest map that shows what's now Glenbridge Avenue, what also later became known as the old road. Um, there's actually a slightly older one than this, but basically the revolutionary era. This was actually uh, surveyed by Robert Erskine, who was one of Washington, actually Washington's first surveyor. Washington himself was a surveyor. He knew the importance of good land surveys. And he realized that if he was going to march his troops up and back down this, the roads of New Jersey, he'd better know where those roads are. So Erskine went out and surveyed with incredible precision. For instance, he took into account, there's actually, you can't see, probably hard to see, but he took into account this, the magnetic declination at the time he was doing this is four degrees. It had varied. So if you zoom in on this, you get what is now Glenridge Avenue and bits of, of, of other streets that formed the old road. And it is incredibly precise. I, I didn't do it here, but if you lay this map on a modern map, it's an exact alignment of modern Glenridge Avenue with this stretch here. You even get Bay Street is listed here, just a little stub of it. You get the crossings kind of behind Lackawanna Plaza by the auto and like the, little y, the, the, the YMCA, the little YMCA over there. You get um, downtown uh, Montclair Church Street, even gets a little bend at Valley and Church. Uh, go, going in the other way into the oranges, you get Dodd and it goes down kind of um, by what's now uh, Rosedale Cemetery. So the, the level of accuracy and care taken in these surveys was just remarkable. And indeed, Washington's troops did march up and down this road. Notice also the road almost exactly parallels Tony's Brook here. That's this other kind of wavy line. So that's the, presumably the reason the native peoples or at least the settlers made this road. They were following the brook. Here is another map. It's, I guess, make it the third oldest map of our area. This is actually done by a French cartographer just maybe a year or two after the previous one. Again, look at this. Here is Glenridge Avenue, this little section of Bloomfield. This is actually Broad Street in, in Bloomfield. This is Bay. This is Valley. This is Orange Road going to the Oranges. It's not quite as good as the previous map, not as accurate, but it's still pretty, it's pretty obvious what's happening. And what's cool about this map is what else it shows. Look at this, headquarters. So the cartographer actually was the aide-de-camp of Marquis de Lafayette, went around with Lafayette. So this is where Lafayette stayed when he was in Crane Town in, I guess it was 1780 or, or thereabouts. He put his headquarters where Nicolo's Bakery now is basically, and he camped his troops across the creek over here. The creek's not shown very well, but it's pretty clear that the troops are camped across from the headquarters, kind of over where Bay Street Station is. So that fulfills what I, I promised you on the talk uh, description. I was going to tell you that they camped a detachment of forces at Bay Street Station, or what became Bay Street Station, and the logic is clear. They're trying to guard this road that led up to Washington, had his headquarters at the time up in Wayne, and he's they're guarding the lower uh, approach to that. In fact, the British, there's actually, a, uh, I didn't mention this in my earlier, the earlier talk, but the, there's a account from the newspapers in, in Manhattan. So the British were aware of this detachment and uh, of forces here. And um, it was, it went, entered into the military decision not to attack Washington and Wayne. There were other factors, of course, would have been very hard to attack that position. Uh, they had, they'd have to go over in the mountain. And anyway, but the British were aware of this detachment here. Okay. 
Muster's three laws of old roads. So when you come to a road intersection, these are the, and this is the kind of thought process you, should, process you can go through to understand what that intersection is. You can look for which road goes through it, follow the topography is uh, like along the creek, usually it's along a creek. And if you see something that's uh, kind of north, maybe just a little off north, odds are, I mean, this isn't always true, speculation, uh, but it's an educated guess that probably it used to be exactly north or exactly east or exactly northwest. And that was just the technology of the day. They, they couldn't orient it precisely along those lines. They didn't even know that there was this deviation. Okay. So I have an ex example that I'm going to skip now, but um, I can stay after the, the time is over and uh, walk you through it. Actually, I've worked out what happened with, with Bay, the interesting story of Bay Street, uh, but we're going to skip that. And I want to talk about something other than a road for a moment, because there's other stuff in our area that's, that tells us about these early land use patterns. So I don't know how many of you have been on this little street. It's a great pandemic place to, to walk in your, your daily constitutional. It's a little bit north of the high school, the uh, Montclair High School. So if you go out about halfway on that little path and you look to the north, you see a bend in the creek. So this is Tony's Brook. It's the same brook that runs through the Glen of Glen Ridge and goes through Edgemont Park as well. Edgemont Park's over here. It makes this sharp bend. So if you're actually walking on that little pathway, you, you get halfway and it's actually really beautiful. I really recommend doing that. Um, when the, the snowstorm stops this weekend, you can go out and look at, at this um, little bend. And actually you can see kind of up here, the beginnings of that bend there. So the creek is, starts to, from Upper Montclair, flows south, it goes east and it flows south again. That bend is absolutely something the colonists would have cared about. Um, it's, it was a, it's a, to them in an otherwise undistinguished landscape, it was an important reference point. And indeed, here it is on a survey from 1721. So when you see that bend, you can actually refer back it's on this survey. And this is a particularly interesting survey. This is very early land grant. This huge area, this is 800 acres of land here. And it's bordered basically by Valley on the east, Broad Street, Newark, uh, Broad Street, Newark, Broad Street, Bloomfield on the, uh, on the east, excuse me, Valley on the west, Broad Street on the east, Watchung on the north, and basically Chestnut on the south. That huge area was one big plot of land of 800 some odd acres. 500 of those went to the Garibrandt family. And you may know the old Garibrandt house on Wachung, kind of near Wachung Plaza. This was their land. Uh, they got it as, as a family, this huge chunk of land and then subdivided among, among themselves. Then this lower part here was a couple hundred leftover acres. I'm not entirely sure what happened uh, to that, but that uh, relates to this question of, of Bay Street. It actually gets down into Bay Street a little bit. We can talk about that later if you like. But I just wanted to show again, you can be walking through our town now and see you know, traces of this very old uh, history. Okay. Let me just close my remarks before we get into some discussion with the, the boiling spring. So this is a general thing about uh, our area uh, because it's so urban or urbanized really that we've lost a lot of the pretty cool geologic formations that used to be here. And one was the great boiling spring. There are actually a number of boiling springs all over the place. And I'll get to what that means in a second. It wasn't a hot spring actually, it was something different. There was actually one by Lackawanna Plaza. There used to be a spring of water there that boiled in this way. Uh, there were other springs as well. Uh, the town of East Rutherford was boiling springs, all sorts of them. But there was one that was known as the Great Boiling Spring. And it was, if you look at Newark, and you go up to the corner of Newark, this is Newark here with all these little trees here, back when there were trees here. Orange, or what's now East Orange, and Bloomfield. At that corner, where the three towns come together was the Great Boiling Spring. This is a map from 1847. This is probably, we don't know what it looked like, 
probably something like this. This is an example in Minnesota. I got from Wikipedia, of course. So the way this geology works, there's actually a geologic survey of an 1885. There's impermeable clay. The, the soil is underlain by an impermeable layer. So the water coming down through the aquifer from the ridge line is coming down under pressure and it erupts out forming this kind of weird, almost like geyser type, uh, miniature geyser kind of uh, formation. There's actually, it was, uh, uh, they're all over the state. This is an example uh, down in Camden and it was actually used as water supply for Camden and also for East Orange. So back in the 1880s, this is a map from 1880, East Orange drilled a number of wells to take advantage of this natural system. They didn't need pumps. The water just came up of its own on its own because of the pressure. Um, this is one of the last areas in certainly in East Orange and in Newark, one of the last areas to be developed. Um, it was just a swamp basically. And today this is what it looks like. You wouldn't even know that that thing was there. It was actually kind of where these three lines almost come together over here. This is the, the three town lines of East Orange, Bloomfield, and Newark. I think this kind of offset in the line, I'm not quite sure why it occurred, probably just to take these houses into, into account. Uh, this is what Google says at least. But right here was this big spring and it was big. It's actually the, the geologist report it's about as big as the ones out in Yellowstone that we see today. And this is all that remains of it today. So you do want to take a drive down to this area uh, where East Orange, uh, you will find uh, this is the only thing left from that, uh, that boiling spring. Okay, so I have a few other things. And if you'd like to stay uh, after we have the discussion group, I'm happy to go back and tell you about some of the other findings that I've had, or we can just one-on-one. -on -one. If you want a copy of the map, email me, please. I'd love to talk about this stuff. Here's my email address. And I look forward to your your questions. Thanks. Earlier on, you talked you you just sort of said in passing that the first map you showed was after I think after it was no before the uh, Irish and before the Italian the original inhabitants meaning white inhabitants not natives and who who were they do we know that who who were they in particular the original inhabitants. Well, I don't mean by family, but by uh, heritage. Yeah, so I, I, that was also the point in my remarks that I think Jane was mentioning there was some feedback. I apologize for that. So this is actually a whole talk in its own right. And it's fascinating how our area was settled. But in broad brush, there were two centers of in-migration. Newark was settled in 1666. Ships came in from the far off exotic land of Connecticut to settle New Jersey. And they settled in Newark. And that was really the English yeah. uh, settlers. And there were what, 60 odd families in the original uh, Newark settlement. Then there was also coming in from uh, the North essentially Bergen County, which, which was originally New Amst part of New Amsterdam was the Dutch. The Garibrands, I showed that kind of large tract was actually, mm -hmm. they were a, a Dutch family and that whole area of what we now know as Brookdale. Actually, Upper Montclair also was essentially a Dutch settlement. That's how why there's a distinction between Upper Montclair and, and Downhill Montclair that persists to this day. It has to do with these, these original, uh, original settlement patterns, original European settlement patterns, you're exactly right to clarify to clarify that. And it, again, it's imprinted on the landscape. I'll go back and show you the map in a second, but what the English kind of had an economical way of, of dividing up their land. They basically did it square. The land plots by and large were square or nearly square. The Dutch were quite different. There were these long rectangular plots mm -hmm. and that had to do with, they usually anchored them on a waterway and then swept inland from the waterway. So that's kind of the pattern you see as you get up into Passaic County and Bergen County, these long narrow strips of land. So like Van Houten uh, Street yeah. up in Clifton, that goes along one of those, uh, those long strips. So the Dutch did not grab the marshy land that was uh, where the great 
boiling spring was? Yeah. So that was really, you know, mind you, this whole, by that time, the whole area is under the, under uh, English colonial rule, yeah, but okay. no, they did, had not yet colonized that particular area. Newark, when they came in, was still inhabited to some extent by native peoples. Obviously, as you, as you read, if you read like 1491 or one of these early books mm. of, uh, obviously, a lot of the people had been wiped out by that point, but there were still some people from whom the settlers uh, who landed in Newark traded for their land. They were actually quite mm -hmm. careful. They, they drew up treaties and they really wanted to keep it on the, on, the, on the up and up, unlike a lot of New Jersey land transactions. For a while, yeah. And so I actually have just one more question and sure. I won't hog any more time. And that is, you mentioned uh, arrowheads found in Brookdale Park, yeah. I think. Do you know where in Brookdale Park they found those? Now, I know Rich Rockwell's here. Rich, I don't know if you remember exactly where those arrowheads were all found. Uh, they're at the Bloomfield Historical Society, and I didn't okay. take down the detailed information. All right, that's fine. Thank you. But when it opens, go back. And, and, and actually, they've got a pretty incredible collection there generally. But this is some of the only Native information we have, right? Um, a few other places, there's reports of burial mounds, maybe, but it's really kind of unclear. George, I have a question in the chat uh, yeah. from Ray. Why did they care about making a road go north um, at all? Uh, magnetic north and also the variation, the declination um, that would come. Right, so right now I'm, I'm speculating. So this is speculation upon speculation, but I do know from other land records that they're just, they're dividing up the land. So they want to give a park to Thomas. They want to give a park to Simeon. They want to give a park to Jasper. And they go in and usually in these oldest deeds, maybe they just don't feel they can, they can mark it out as precise. So they just say north. So as time goes on, they're a bit more granular. They go like north 15 west. They kind of are more precise in their surveying, but the very old surveys are almost all cardinal directions. And I mean, remember, they're dividing up a land that had never, under European settlement, been divided before. Um, you can actually, I'll go back later and show you the map, or you, I'll send it to you if you like. Some of these other, some of these, basically, they had a line 90 degree corners as a result of this, this original way they surveyed. And those 90 degree corners were there for a long time, well into the 19th century. And then as the, you know how we are in New Jersey, we like to straighten our roads. Over time, they would they would kind of sell off little bits of plots and create a single large plot that was perpendicular to the road, but that wasn't the original configuration. Uh, originally was divided up in this kind of, kind of more odd way. You have another question. Um, at the Mid Park Lane actually drew, uh, Jim said, my children have already referred to them as secret passages. Yes. And um, uh, someone else says, do you know the origin of those little secret passages? That I do not. That's Mike, Mike Pirelli. I don't know if he's here right now. He's the person to ask about that. I, I don't know why that's there. That, that does not correspond. I checked this. I do know it does not correspond to an original or even 19th century land um, uh, property line. That's someone's, that was through somebody's property at one point. My understanding, and it may be from Mike that I learned this, um, is that when you're walking, you know, before you had before you had the cars to drive around the block, um, if you have a long block like the one um, that Mid Park Lane intersects, um, it allows you to go from the train station up to that area without having to walk all the way around. And so it was a it was a footpath deliberately so that it cut the longer blocks shorter so it was easier to walk. Yeah, and I know down if you get down into the very far south end of Glen Ridge, going into East Orange, there's actually a couple alleyways kind of behind houses mm. that the developer of that area put in when they developed it. They wanted to have a place for people's garages, for example. And maybe something happened with Mid Park Lane when the developer bought up that whole farm and subdivided it. They said, hey, let's keep this footpath so that people can get to the training more easily. Right. Added to the list, Jane, things we have to research. Definitely. Other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, years ago, I saw a presentation that showed a map of um, Lenape trails, I guess, you know, native trails throughout New Jersey. 
and then they overlaid it with major highways and they were a pretty good match to that. So is, is there any of that that you came across for Essex County? So yes, I, I've gone through some of those lectures and, and there's some attempts to reconstruct the, the trail, the Goodmanisink Trail. It's better developed for other parts of, it's not really well developed for Montclair, Bloomfield, Glenridge. So for instance, I think South Orange Avenue is pretty well established to have been a major native trail. It's actually on those early reconstructed maps. But uh, what we now call Glenridge Avenue, the old road here, or Franklin, Franklin leading to Broad, leading to Glenridge Avenue, leading to Claremont, that doesn't appear on these maps. Our area was kind of a blank for that kind of uh, reconstruction, unfortunately. But if you, as I said, if you get down to the oranges, or, or indeed also if you go up into Passaic, that's where those trails tend to be, but not here. Not even Wachong Avenue? Yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, Wachong Avenue is perplexing. Um, Wachong Avenue seems like it should be a native trail. It seems to have all the indications of it. Um, it's referred to in the earliest deeds as the road past Nicholas Garibrand's house. And that's the old house up by Watchung Plaza, that spectacular, thank God it's, it survived all these years house that's there. Um, but there's no, and at T-junctions at Valley, right? So it doesn't seem to fit the, and it doesn't follow a river. It doesn't seem to fit any of the characteristics of a native trail. Washington though, Washington Street, Washington Avenue and the South End uh, going from downtown um, Bloomfield up into the south end of, of Montclair, probably, I think it's a native trail uh, because it, it links two obvious geographic features that the native people would have recognized. It links where the second river branched in Watsessing Park with Nishuane Creek up in the south end of Montclair. A uh, question on Hinks Alley. Um, it's one of those footpaths. Yeah, I love that. They were asking who Hink was, and Jeff answered and said the mayor and a developer. Yes, he's actually the guy who built um, the building that um, anthropology is in um, oh. now on the corner of, you know, it's where the old church used to be uh, on the corner of Church Street and Bloomfield Avenue. Um, and he also was responsible, his na first name was Christopher, and um, he was responsible for developing Christopher Street as well. And I'm sure other places and Helen might be able to shed more light on that. Other questions? Um, this is Phyllis Kent. Um, we uh, have done extensive amount of research on the Kent, the Spear, um, Zig mm. families all in uh, Spear Town. And we have um, uh, Bloomfield area also. Um, and one of the things that has come about was that they were all Dutch settlers, all intermarried. They did intermarry some with the Garibrands um, and some of the other families up in that North End. They also commented about, um, we have a book from the Old Stone Church. And that book um, refers to um, the fact that the Dutch reform had uh, the church down on, uh, in the meadows, which is uh, Brookdale, and the one up on the top on Valley. Wait, 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 wait. Um, okay. Those those two churches were related as Dutch Reformed churches back in the day, and that the families uh, oh you know, made the second church because they didn't want to travel so far. <laughs> I can imagine in those days, but I I imagine that uh, Mount Hebron was uh, probably the main road between them. Um, you know, thinking about uh, that as a you know an, an original trail that uh, up to Valley Road. So I would love to, Phyllis, you and I, I'd love to talk to you more about this because I'm just getting in now to mapping that area for Montclair, Speartown. Um, I have a little bit of information that Kent's had a lot of your, I guess, descendants or your ancestors had a lot of uh, land in that area. It's hard to figure out. It's actually, for some reason, that um, maybe because the antiquity of the Dutch settlement in our area, it's actually harder to do than the, on the English side. So I'd love to talk to you. The one thing I can tell you is I do have the road return for the original road in that area. It was not what you expect. It basically was, if you imagine going over um, 
what's what's what is the road? We're Broad Street. I um, it's about to cross over the Parkway as we're going on into toward Nutley, uh, like west where it enters West Passaic. West Passaic, and it, yeah. It's like a sushi restaurant over there. Um, you're kind of where the Brookdale service area is on the Parkway. Right, and the Kents the Kents owned a farm right at that point. Um, Great. So the road started there. Mm -hmm. That's the, the road started there. It went kind of over to the shop right. Then it went up Bellevue, up to Valley. Then it went up Valley a little bit. Then it actually went off Valley and went up over the mountain into Little Falls. Right. The, one of the Spear homes is on, um, what is that, Long Hill Road or whatever they wanted. Right. 612 Upper oh. Mountain Avenue. Upper Mountain, too. Oh, upper Mountain, yeah. But as it goes up the hill, it changes. Yeah. That's the original road that's there. It's not... The other roads, all those other roads are even Upper Valley, a valley north of, of um, where it intersects of Bellevue was not a road originally. Their actual real road was the one that continues going up to the Upper Mountain and then over. Well, the Spear House is still there. It's marked as a historical um, location. I, I have stopped and visited the people who live oh, cool. about it. Um, there's quite a bit, I, I think, Jane, some of that history in, in the, the Montclair History Museum. Um, but we, we do have quite a bit of information about that portion of the family. Um, I also have uh, pictures from the 1870s of uh, one block over from Mount Hebron. I don't remember the name of the street, but actually it, the house is still there and it, the whole family was sitting out in, <laughs> in the yard for this outside picture. Um, and it's you know basically across from that, um, I don't know the name of the church now, um, Valley Road and Mount Hebron um, intersection. It's just Alexander uh, Avenue. Not as far as Alexander. No, no. It's Nass there. Nassau, Macapin. I don't. No, I don't know the name. There's a church in the corner of Valley Road and Mount Hebron. Yeah, currently. Yeah, and you can see this house from the that corner from the church yeah. house, and um, and that was um, Sigler um, there and Force. Um, so those are the the owners in at that point in time. I don't know who owned, might have owned it before. They're all related. Right. We have pictures of that um, house from the 1870s. Still looks a lot. It still looks the same. Exactly the same. <laughs> yes, it does. Mm -hmm. So Alex asks if a stream runs through one's property. This almost sounds like it's the beginning of a joke here. If a stream <laughs> runs through one's property, um, did you own the stream or were the streams streams considered common? Yes, a really, really good question. Most of the time they were held in common, but there are, for the mill sites, there are separate deeds or separate sections of deeds for uh, basically the use of the water. You didn't own the water exactly, but you own the power. So the water might fall 10 feet in that distance. You would have that effective amount of, of, of energy to run your mill. You'd also have the privilege of watering over the land. There was a kind of a funny expression, 18th century expression for it, where you basically, you're allowed to dam the pond and create a pond there. So one of the oldest, well, the oldest one I know, and there may be older ones, was Jeremiah Baldwin's sawmill. So this was basically the corner of, again, at uh, Bay Street and Glenbridge Avenue, kind of where Bay Street Station is, there used to be um, well, there's been a succession of mills on that site over a century, but the oldest one that I know of was by Jeremiah Baldwin. There may have been another old mill kind of where um, Franklin crosses the Second River, and there may have been a Davis mill. Um, but again, they, they, they flooded that whole area. They are actually behind my house. That used to be a, a pond, and then it was turned over. Israel Crane owned it for a while, then the Wilds owned it. Uh, then it was just nothing until uh, the street grid was, was put in. Okay, they're coming fast and furious. Oh my God, yeah. Um, how and when was the area containing the Great Boiling Springs developed? Yeah, okay, so yeah, I didn't get into the whole story, but basically what happened is, so East Orange drills these wells in the, I think, mid 1880s. And they get a lot of water. It's a lot of water coming down through that aquifer that they were able to siphon off. But East Orange keeps growing. By the way, East Orange was an absolute innovator in engineering terms. Uh, I think it was forced on them because they were boxed in by other towns, but they, they did a lot of innovative work in water works and sewage works. There used to be a big sewage plant kind of by Watsessing Park. And 
Uh, God, it's a beautiful building. It's in Scientific American from that era. Um, that's how substantial this was as an engineering project. So anyway, they, they, uh, they basically overran their water supply. They, they needed more water supply. That's when they got the one out by Livingston and Short Hill Mall. And you know, when you drive through in the JFK Parkway, that's all East Orange's waterworks. And they decommissioned the one at Boiling Spring and it was sold to developers and they drained it in uh, 1910. So that's when the grid comes in, the, the, the grid that we recognize today. You, know, you can't even tell where East Orange begins and Newark ends, right? It's just a continuous urban grid across there now. It's actually, there's a laundromat kind of there. It's, it, I think it's kind of sad. Why can't they just put up a historic marker to indicate that there had been this spring there? But that's just me, right? And so we have uh, someone who lives on Gordonhurst Avenue who'd like to share a tale. Go Great. ahead. I'm Glenn. Oh, hi, Glenn. Uh, I live on Gordonhurst Avenue in Upper Montclair, which is an east-west street that goes from Grove Street up to Valley Road. So um, the legend on the block, which has been passed down for generations, is that Gordon was the farmer on the top of the hill at Valley Road, and Hurst is the Dutch name for orchard. So if you do go to Valley Road and you head north on Valley Road from Gordonhurst, there is a very ancient uh, farmhouse there that, is a his that has a historical marker on it. And that is what we are told was Gordon's house who owned the Hurst and that the orchards went all the way down the hill on all of that property down to Grove Street. And, um, and you know, at, yeah, and 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 which which ends now at where Brookdale Park is. So at some point they put in Brookdale Park, but maybe the farmer even owned, you know, everything all the way down there. Okay, Brookdale Park is where you found the arrowheads. Anyway, I didn't know what to think of this, and uh, but we began noticing that in the back of our house is um, a stand of very ancient trees that unfortunately lately have been falling down, but they're very ancient, they're oaks and maples. Wow, and when they fall down, people cut into them and they have rings that make them really, really old. So another ancient uh, a person on the block before he moved out said, oh yeah, that was Gordon, Gordon's Road from um, Grove Street up to the farmhouse. And in fact, you can trace that line of trees and it does go right up to that ancient farmhouse. So apparently the, the story is that those trees were marking the, the uh, what, the southern end of the, the little road that went from Grove Street up to Gordon's Hurst. The only thing that's suspicious about this is that Gordon is not a Dutch name. But if Hearst is means orchard, why didn't he have a Dutch name? Is, Gordon sounds in English. So I don't know, maybe he bought it from a Dutch farmer and named it after himself. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. That's, I love that kind of detail. And you're very attentive to the, um, the, the, fa the flora of our area and what it might, it might indicate to us. Um, one thing, and, and those of you who want me to send you a copy of the map, I will do that. But one thing I've done on the map is every time I notice a deed mentioning an orchard, or a quarry, I put that on the map. I have a little, I, what did I use? A little tree symbol for the orchard, a little kind of digging symbol for the quarry. And there, of course, there are orchards all over the place. Probably everybody had one. There's just millions of them. We had all the cider mills. There's just a talk on that some years ago, right? About the, the apple cider mills of, of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that's, you, you get me going to orchards, I can talk all day, but <laughs> Uh, there's an area called Crab Orchard. There's been some confusion as to where it is. Uh, it, it actually seems to be in, in what's now Glenridge, just off Washington Street, just south of Washington, uh, that actually was a camp for the uh, uh, Continental Army. And crab apples are, are native to North America, so it may well have been originally a native orchard. The, the, the native peoples are obviously quite well known for their keeping of orchards. Uh, and they moved around the, the landscape over the course of the, the seasons of the year in order to tend them. George, I just wanted to say oh. that, uh, George, I just wanted to say that uh, Gordonhurst is a very unusual name for a street, for an yeah. avenue. 
So there must be something to the tale when they were originally naming the streets when they cut up the orchard. Somehow well, they decided to main, name Gordonhurst after the farmer. It possibly, who knows? Yeah. So I think I haven't mapped that area yet. Let's talk in two months when I get up to there. I'm, I'm <laughs> almost there actually. So I better answer your question with more authority. Then. I'll show you the. I'll show you where the trees are in my backyard. Cool. Yeah. Let's do it. So we're um, actually running a little bit late on time, but George has graciously agreed to hang around if anybody has further questions. Before you leave though, I think I, I just was fascinated by the discussion this afternoon on Bay Street and the name of it. And George, you had na you name your three theories and then talk about what other people had said today. Okay, so Bay Street. First of all, there's, I, and I can do this in 10 minutes or so as, as people clear out. Um, there's a fascinating kind of geographic story about Bay Street, Bay Avenue, and actually there was a single street originally that kind of bent around where Mountainside Hospital now is. That seems to have been named after the Bay, an area called the Bay. It was basically the entire area north, if you imagine Bay Avenue going up, uh, it's Avon Place in Glen Ridge. It's kind of where Broad Street makes its bend as you're kind of going up broad toward uh, Wachung and makes a kind of a bend in the road by the golf course, basically. Um, that whole area west of Broad, north of Bay Avenue was called the Bay. So why? What's up with that? And it's very old. It's actually, I've got a, at least 1802, and I see mentions of the Bay. And so I had presented three theories and we had another extremely compelling theory mentioned in the talk at noon. So the theories are, one, Bay means uh, something related to the mills that were at the foot of the, of the hill. So that Bay uh, Street, which originally called Bay Lane, was actually a street between the mills at Brookside Park, kind of where the, the garden center is across from the Exxon station, going up to Crane Town. That was just a, a commercial road to get into Crane Town from the mill site. And they built a number of reservoirs for the mills that were known as bays. So that's one explanation. The only problem is it's actually not, the bays aren't there in on the bay, they're down the hill. Two, that bay geographically, it's not a common use of the term bay geographically, but it can mean not just a water body, but a land feature. So when you have kind of an indentation in a, in a ridge line, rarely it's referred to as a bay. And indeed, Bay Lane, Bay Avenue, goes up such an indentation in the ridge line there. Third, bay trees. So bay trees do grow in New Jersey. They, uh, this far north, they, they're usually in swampy areas. And indeed, the area down there was rather swampy. So that's that. And then there was this fourth Actually, a few other ideas, but the one that I love the most that came out in the discussion today is bay or some other pronunciation of that word is actually a Dutch word for tobacco. And I did a little poking around uh, on Google and Google Books this afternoon. I couldn't quite pin it down, but the Dutch are said to have grown tobacco actually on Manhattan Island, but maybe also in Bergen County, kind of um, in the Meadowlands, basically. So there may have been big plantations, believe it or not, we had them here too, of tobacco. Um, and maybe that area, which is the boundary between the English and the Dutch settlement pattern, may have been a originally tobacco farm. But I'm open to other ideas for why the heck they called it the Bay. All right, anybody else have any final questions? I have a question. Uh, why I have a lot of the maps and the property names seem to be women overwhelmingly over name men. Did these women inherit it? Were they married into it? An awful lot of the properties are identified as being owned by women. What was that reason? Yeah, so the, in this period, um, and, well, actually today even, right? Um, the, uh, most of the, okay, I've looked at a lot of wills, so I can speak with a little bit of authority on this. Normally, the pattern of a will, if, if someone had any estate to leave, was the sons got the land, the girls, the daughters, they, well, they could be married, the daughters got the, the, the money and the furniture and the kind of movable part of the estate. And typically, also, if the, 
there was a widow, if she had not predeceased um, the husband in that case, she would have use of the house and the land until her decease, whereupon it would descend to the, the sons. So some, I mean, I have to look at the detail area you're thinking of. Sometimes it's the widow that I'm identifying on that map. That's why you see female name. But, you know, people broke convention or maybe they didn't have sons, but sometimes they gave the land to their daughter. There was nothing stopping them from doing it. It just wasn't the, the custom. So a lot of daughters inherited, just like their, their brothers, chunks of their, their parents or their father's really estate. And there's a lot of interesting stories with that. Sometimes they got married, sometimes they didn't. Um, so in general, it's a patrilineal system in terms of land, but not always. Okay, thanks. Phyllis Kent also just said that there was a tobacco factory in Caldwell. I if saw that. Know. Phyllis, where, I don't know where you went on the screen. You and I have to talk. We've got a lot of information <laughs> that we, oh, there you are. I see you. We can- so, uh, um, Your email no, is in the, um, uh, the chat. And so again, somebody put it in there for you. And so um, I'm sure that people will be reaching out to you. And I got my copy of the map today and I'm very excited to go through it. So uh, um, George, thank you. Um, I'm gonna officially close the meeting now, but you are welcome to stay on for a couple of minutes and chat with George uh, further if you have anything else you'd like to say. I'm happy to thank stay here a bit longer. And if you wanna see more tonight. slides. Two weeks from tonight, we have our last uh, History at Home of the Year, and I will be talking about uh, holiday traditions and also showing some of the beautiful, absolutely beautiful ones that were done by the Garden Club of Montclair this year. So hope you join us on that one. A nice way to start. Bring your eggnog. <laughs>